Welcome. Thank you all for, for, for um, logging on and dialing in. Um, so these are times in which, you know, I think we will all look back and go once a century, things like this happen, uh, change human history is probably not an inaccurate statement. Um, and I think we've seen so much pain and so much trauma and so much devastation um, and so much loss as a result of, of the coronavirus. But we've also seen this corresponding sense of generosity, of altruism, of community, of reciprocity, of support. And it has been one of the great, uh, um, wonderful things about being part of the conduit community that we have been able to galvanize such an extraordinary group of people and be galvanized by them in turn to be, to be able to provide assistance. So I wanted to sort of just give everybody a high level um, sense of what we've managed to do so far and then have a conversation with some of the people who have been um, incredibly generous and they're only a subsection of the overall group. So I'm gonna give a shout out to everybody. But to date, uh, we have delivered 25,987 meals um, to three separate um, institutions, three, two um, hospitals. And uh, in addition to that, 16,700 loaves of bread. Um, we have raised from the community 145,000 pounds. Um, and we have also um, mobilized a whole range of support um, to help force both in the form of donations, um, monetary donations and in-kind donations to try and provide additional support to the NHS um, volunteer campaign, how to provide volunteerism and volunteers um, and in-kind support to, to the NHS. Um, and this involved a whole cornucopia of people. So a huge shout out to Ralph Lauren, um, who have provided you know, cornerstone support in this entire endeavor and who's um, who brought this to my attention and, and asked for help, partly because of our long standing um, support to the Royal Marsden and some work that we had done bringing attention to the incredible work that happens at the Royal Marsden. Um, Gail's uh, Bakery, who we'll hear from shortly, who you know, answered a call at a moment's notice, literally a moment's notice, and was delivering um, virtually the very next day, in fact, the very next day. Um, Wasabi, um, Insight Investments, who've made a substantial contribution, Swarovski, who've made a substantial contribution, Indie Base Snacks, um, Daphne, who's an incredible member at The Conduit, who sort of leapt in and has provided support, uh, Ayuna, Lifesaver, City Harvest, Rocket, um, who are playing a really important role in the delivery um, of hot meals and have really been at the core of this together with Gales uh, and Latour Pasta. And then some wonderful media support um, from the New York Times. In fact, uh, this is a copy of uh, yesterday's New York Times. This is the front page. If you turn around, this is the back page. And those of you who know anything about advertising know that this is very important real estate. And in that is a quarter paid ad calling out our campaign uh, in the New York Times, which is really, really wonderful. Um, we've also had shout outs uh, from um, Gillian Tett in the Moral Money column um, uh, in the Financial Times. So we've had, and I'm, I'm certain that somebody's gonna send me a text at some point saying you've forgotten to sh give me a shout out as well. But if you just think for a moment how um, from one simple phone call from Ralph Lauren to one simple phone call to Tom to a mobilization through Manisha Patel, who's um, in this uh, webinar, has really been a, a more vivid illustration of the power of community you can't imagine. So I want to start with Manisha. Um, uh, Manisha, tell us a little bit about 
what you do on a daily basis, about your experience of Lewisham, what it's like, um, because I think it's always useful to hear about, hear from people on the, on the front lines who are providing life-saving assistance to people. Um, hi, Paul. So I'm a clinical lead. I run Stroke Rehabilitation Services. And um, so that means managing large teams who would sort support patients who have strokes. We're also linking quite heavily with the whole organisation, uh, both of our uh, acute hospital sites and our community services. Um, so the past month feels like it's been about a year uh, in terms of how much has happened in the space of just over a month. Um, it's been really very, very stressful for staff. As you can imagine, the change has had to happen really, really quickly. Uh, we've had um, change, physical changes in our hospitals, changes of our wards, uh, staff redeployed to where the needs are most. So most of the, many staff coming into the hospitals to work in environments which they may, they may not have worked on before. We had staff off sick and we sort of stretched in terms of people having stages of when they're self-isolating and when they're recovering. And then you've got to combine that all with um, having to deal with death, death that you're dealing with every day, seeing lots of sick patients, also your personal experience of people um, dying from the coronavirus or suffering the coronavirus, and then managing your basic daily needs. So, you know, in the first few weeks coming home from work, not being able to access food, not being able to access household goods, you're exhausted, you're mentally and physically tired, and you, it's just beyond what you can cope with. Um, many of our staff are not sleeping because they're kind of running on this energy constantly. I think with the NHS, we have amazing staff, but we do all put on our superhero capes at this time, and sometimes we forget to look after ourselves because we all want to do so much to help. I would say that this has become the new normal, so for many staff, they've started to adjust to this way of working. But there will be, you know, this is a marathon, not a sprint. And there will be long-term needs in terms of emotional support and physical well-being that we need to keep focusing on to look after our staff so they can continue to provide the services in the NHS. Um, in terms of, um, I'd just like to say, firstly, a really big thank you to The Conduit, to Tom, to Nadia, to all the organisations, Ralph Lauren and everybody else and all the individuals that have contributed to this project. Um, I mean, we had the food for about a week or just over a week and the difference that it's made is just really heartwarming. I see so many staff around the hospital picking up their food collections. But, you know, I've never had so many conversations about bread. So Gail's bread has been very popular, Tom. Um, but also the fact that it's healthy, nutritious food. We get a lot of junk food, we get a lot of things that are easy to grab and go when you're working long shifts. But actually, we still need to nourish ourselves so we can continue. And that has just been really, really fantastic. Um, it's the talk of the town in the hospital. People do queue up with social distancing to collect the food. Um, so thank you, because that's one basic need that's met. So if you had a long shift, you've got something to eat and you've got something to take home. Really, really appreciate it. I'm really grateful for that. So Manisha, I wanted to ask you um, a, a question just about the um, what what things look like going forward. Because mm -hmm. obviously, you know, while we begin to see the you know the infections and the death peak, um, I think it may be too early to start declaring victory. And as you said, it's a marathon and not a sprint. And there's a very real danger that we as humans with very short attention spans turn our attention to the next bright, shiny object and forget that our, our health systems are still going to be under siege. And more importantly, you're a person who deals with strokes. So um, there's so many other underlying health conditions that people have held off. They haven't come to hospital. Um, you know, and, and there's going to be this kind of backlog of people getting back into hospitals when we, please God, see the coronavirus um, um, seriously ill start beginning to diminish. So it's, this is not a quick fix. We're going to have to think of ways to provide support and to bolster the NHS for months and years to come. Is that, is that a fair summary? I think that is a fair summary. So I think there are different strands to this issue. I think there's going to be long-term mental health support needs. So one of the pieces of work I'm leading on is psychological support services for staff. And again, we've had an amazing response from our local communities with local therapists and psychologists wanting to help. 
I don't think we're there where everybody needs that level of support at the moment because they're running on their energy and their cylinders. But as we start coming out of this and things start calming down, it's going to really hit many of our staff in terms of the amount of change and the amount of trauma that they've been through. So I think we can learn from other incidents and other events in terms of what do we need to put in place for our staff to look after their well-being. So that's definitely a need. I think there's also something, like you said, people are not accessing hospital services. So we've seen a real drop in the rate of patients that are coming in with strokes and heart attacks, for example, compared to the norm for this time of year. And I understand that the public are afraid of coming into hospital and then getting sick, but they still need these specialist treatments. And so we need a bit of a campaign to really encourage people to come to A&E when they need to. So A&Es generally for our non-COVID patients are not as busy as normal. And so again, it's getting that message out. The other thing I'd like to touch on Paul is obviously London is very diverse and Lewisham and Greenwich is one of the most diverse boroughs, two boroughs in London. And we have obviously a overrepresentation of black and Asian minority ethnic um, people dying from coronavirus, including NHS staff. And I think that is a really a big wider discussion and the inquiry and everything that needs to go into that. But also our voices need to be heard in terms of what people are feeling. Yeah, and a final question before I, I pivot onto others, but I do think, I, I do want to dwell on this for a moment because I think we keep saying that, that the coronavirus is, a, is both a mirror to the existing problems in our society and arguably also a magnifier. It takes those problems and it throws them into sharp relief. And if you've got pre-existing inequalities and pre-existing underlying health conditions stemming from discrimination or inequality, the vulnerable die in larger numbers. And I've been struck when you read the NHS workers who pass as a result of this, when you read their names, you know that a very significant number of them are, are you know, Black, Asian, Middle Eastern uh, of origin. And it seems to me to be just a double injustice there to, to lose brave people at the front line and also people who, in other settings, experience discrimination and prejudice. Absolutely. Uh, and sadly, we've lost uh three staff in the past week and we have a, a few more that are unwell and majority from uh, ethnic minorities. I think there's a lot that can be done in terms of really looking at where the inequalities are in terms of uh, systemic discrimination, access to health services and how we improve that, how we learn from these lessons. You know, we want our post-coronavirus world to be an area where things are different and where we are working on improving the statistics and improving the health outcomes for everyone. So um, I think it's really key that we use this time to do that and as we move into recovery phase in the future. So I want to pivot and, and, and uh, speak to Tom for a moment. So Tom, um, you attended a, a, a meeting of the conduits on a, on a food incubator and accelerator that we're launching with Catapult to try and put substantial funding into the next re generation of healthy food companies trying to um, you know, improve both the, the carbon uh, footprint of food, but also make food healthier and more fit for purpose. And when I got the call from Ralph Lauren to see what could be done to support um, frontline NHS workers, you immediately sprung to mind. I picked up the phone and said, hey, Tom, it's Paul. We're going to need food for frontline NHS workers. And I, I remember, you know, took literally one second said i'm in what can we do can we start delivering tomorrow um so tell me what it's like to be running a, a very successful network of bakeries over 50 across london and suddenly to be shut down but having to continue to do this work well paul um i do remember that call very vividly and thinking you know we're normally we're serving 1500 chefs a day with our wholesale business. We've been in business 30 years. It's craft bakery, serving those chefs and also serving about 59 gales. And we were seeing restaurants closing, venues closing, hotels, you know, Dorchester, Lanesboro, they were shutting down, airline lounges shutting down. We do a lot of the boxes for Wembley Arsenal, uh, a number of places and everything was shutting down. And our reaction when there's kind of a crisis, I guess, is kind of like a grandparent, which is, you know, how do we make things better through food? And we know that food is 
both nutritious, you know, for the body and for the soul. And we were, as a bunch of craftsmen, craftspeople, making food, wondering what we're going to do with this mission that we have, which is to, you know, be making world-class bread, doing world-class baking, making it accessible to people when the people we were serving had disappeared. So when I got your call, I just thought, yes, that's, this is a great channel for us to, to channel our energies. So the logistics of that, I mean, you, you have a, a, a very substantial bakery that you, you do all your work from, but what's it like trying to keep up both safety and morale? Because, you know, I should imagine it's tough to a keep your people safe, but also keep producing in the way that you have for hospitals and for others. And, and this is by no means not the only thing that you're, 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 you're lending support to, but how do you just keep it up? Yeah, I think it's tough. I mean, it's a lot of, it's a delicate balance, right? Because you want to protect the people uh, with whom you work. You still want to serve and carry out your purpose. You need to do it all in a safe way. And that and what is safe changes a lot, you know, over time. Um, I'm trying to understand what the, the meaningful things you can do. Um, we, you know, I think one of the things that has always resonated with, you know, kind of the professionals that, have, that make up our bakery, and our bakeries is, um, is to always have a, like a, a key purpose. And that, and if you lean on that in times of crisis, then you kind of think, okay, I always take a risk to come to work. It's just a different risk now. I need to lower that risk that's more uh, in my face today. Uh, but I still need to go about and do what I'm doing. And I think um, we, I remember we did a survey of our uh, people uh, last year. And one of the things they were most proud of, besides the quality of the food, was that we, were, we cared about the environment. And it's interesting to see how, especially this new generation, uh, you know, cares about a lot of things, and it cares that you care about a lot of things. So, this, you know, pandemic is, crisis was an opportunity for us, I think, to to help a different group of people in a better way. Um, I think this effort that you, that you put through and that, that you've organized with Ralph Lauren and then with all the sponsors. It's given us a chance to um, have something else that we're proud of. And in these days, it's great to be proud of being a part of a solution rather than a problem. Well, speaking of which, Nadia, I want to sort of bring you in because um, you in some ways are an embodiment within the Swarovski group uh, of purpose and, and, and the goals of the company as a whole, but also, you know, head up the foundation's work. And um, so, so, uh, so tell us a little bit about from where you sit, especially mm -hmm. since you wear both a big corporate hat, but also a, a, a philanthropic hat, um, how this has affected your work and also what, what called you to be of support in the wonderful way that you have. Mm. Well, I have to say, I would like to mention here that we are so lucky to have amazing trustees in the Swarovski Foundation, and you are one of them. So <laughs> for those who did not realize that, and Paul, your contribution to our um, discussions has been fantastic. And um, I think Swarovski is a better company because we do have that foundation now. And just from our point of view, we've been around for 125 years. And you know, we create a product or we, we strive to create a product that makes people happy, you know, that enhances their lives. Um, but then we just felt, what else can the company give? Um, money's not the only currency. What else can we provide to this world? And certainly that's manpower. You know, that is, you know, alone by communicating to our, all of our employees about what the foundation does, who then communicate on to their families, you know, just alone increasing the awareness of the topics that are out there that's already a contribution. Um, I think what we've also seen through the foundation is that the, our own employee engagement seems to have increased. They're so proud of the work that the foundation does. Um, in particular, when we also enable our colleagues 
to give donations to certain causes, you know, and I think this is why it's so special now to work with you on this project because um, ever so often we feel so hopeless about what we can do to contribute and, uh, you know, what we can give to make a difference. And I think, you know, just a few weeks ago, we were all at home in a panic, locked up, feeling so frustrated that we can't see people, but even more so frustrated about the fact that we can't really help. So, you know, when I just um, read about what you're doing, it was just obviously a natural for us to, to contribute. Um, and I have to say, our business is definitely suffering. You know, we had to shut down our factory in Austria. We had to shut down our factory in Thailand and in Vietnam. We are furloughing people. Um, we have absolutely, you know, felt the decrease in sales and business. But nonetheless, you know, it's, it's I think everyone in our corporation, but I'm sure as also within other companies, you know, one still has so many blessings to count every single day, starting with one's health, if that is there. Mm -hmm. And then certainly family and togetherness. And I think what you're doing here, Paul, just community and um, coming together, creating that um, very, very powerful channel of communication um, and impacting or enabling things to happen through that channel of communication is just amazing. So, you know, we have given what we've tried. We want to give more at this point, you know, we can, but I have to say, I just, um, at this point, so we just want to take it step by step. And um, what I eventually then I'm also interested to discuss with you further is how can, how more can we help in kind? Because um, especially if we're now furloughing people, there might be the availability in time. I can only speak for my team and particularly here in London, they're such kind and caring people. Um, we're definitely also wanting to put them in touch with institutions, organizations where they can um, donate their time and their care. So let's do it. There's some awesome questions coming up, but but thank you for that. And I think Nadia has, I mean, a combination of what Tom and Nadia both said that you know, strong companies and strong you know are are driven by a sense not just of of profit but also deeply of purpose. And I think absolutely social psychologists will tell you that you are never happier than you're being when you're being generous and thinking of others than thinking of yourself. Um, so there is this great paradoxical enlightened self-interest in, 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 in giving and being purposeful because it actually helps you as well. Um, and so now I have a question I'm going to put to Tom. And actually, I know the answer to this because of a call that you and I had today, which is, and I'm going to... <laughs> just how can vulnerable people buy flour that you might normally have bought or used there is a big shortage generally well we've um basically taken what we have in the bakery and packed it in the little bags that we that we have uh, normally for finished bread and i think we've been selling i don't know at least you know, a couple of maybe 100 or so a day 1.5 kilo bags. So I know that they were out in the supermarkets. So one of the evolutions for Gales to adapt to this the ones, the very few ones that are open was to put flour. Let me, I mean, I find I've had some great stories of people baking. You know, my daughter has been baking, friends have been baking. People email us all the time about their new sourdough um, <laughs> capabilities and given us a lot of questions about how they keep their mother doughs alive. So this is an excellent time, you know, if you're at home and you're looking for things to do with your, with your kids or yourself, um, just to bake. Well, I, I can testify to the fact that I went and bought three of those today and we have baked more in our family over the last three weeks than we have in the last three years. So it's been there's something very biblical and communal about baking and getting something out of the oven and then serving it up to the family. So it's been amazing. So, so Natasha Burroughs um, has asked a question and I want to just pause and give a big shout out to both Natasha, who heads our business development um, uh, efforts and uh, Bianca Moody, who have been 
uh, Bianca has been the coordinator of this campaign and, and Natasha has done the kind of press and media work, but together they have been very, very significantly responsible for all of this work. So a big chapeau to them. Um, and, the, and Natasha asks, um, why does it always take a crisis to forge amazing collaborations between the private and public sector? How can we make these types of par partnerships the norm, particularly with regard to climate action? And I would argue, you know, how do we keep this up when the crisis fades to think of all the ways in which we can be generous and collaborative? And it goes to your point as well, Nadia, about volunteerism and other ways that people can support in kind. Manisha, do you want to take a crack just at... Okay, um, I'll take a crack. I think... Um, okay. uh, How do you think we can be helpful? Yeah. I think um, just the point, firstly, a really big thanks to Natasha and Bianca because I know how much work has gone on behind the scenes uh, to make the food deliveries to the NHS organisations possible. So big, big thank you. Um, the conduit does offer that space of connecting somebody like myself from the public sector who is part of the community with all the connections with Tom and Nadia and all the wider organisations and how we work together. So for me, it's about let's do more of this. Let's bring in more people like myself from different organisations, whether it's around environment or health or you know justice. And let's think, how do we connect people together? How do we start doing those transformations that we need to do? But also develop programs if people do want to give back or do want to offer their help to various uh, public sectors or communities, what are the opportunities out there for them to do that? So I think it is that whole word, the conduit, bring us together and let's share that knowledge and that information. Tom? I say something, Paul. Yeah, please. Yeah, I mean, I thought a lot about this and, you know, I think that some of it is that we celebrate it now because it's so critical. But if you look at the people that, you know, the nurses and the doctors that go to the hospitals every day, they always risk their lives. If you take a look at, you know, we've been, we have end of the day products that go to seven different hospitals on a normal time. We give to 40 charities. You know, I'm sure Nadia has been, you know, she has a foundation. You know, she's her, you know, the purpose of that foundation is to help. So I think a lot of this does get done in normal times. I think probably we don't celebrate it as much. And I think there's a great opportunity for us to uh, get away from the bad news and talk a little bit more about what we're doing and then build on those things. Nadia, some, some thoughts? I mean, you were instrumental in setting up the foundation and, and yeah. through the company as a whole. Mm -hmm. No, I have to say, you know, it's so interesting because the entire concept of foundation is so much more prevalent in, I want to say, uh, the UK and North America. It's not such a European concept because people are just so used to paying high taxes in European countries. And then, of course, it was the church and you paid your church tax. Um, I think foundations really are opening up to connect with what the individual really and what to whom the individuals want to give back. So just that foundation concept is wonderful. Um, I think what's really interesting about this crisis right now is that also um, I think the general public is realizing, you know what, it doesn't really require a lot of monetary donation in order to have an impact. And I feel sometimes there's a little bit of intimidation in terms of giving because you feel, well, if I'm not gonna give a lot, little is not gonna help, but actually just to the contrary. Um, and we find that also when we enable our colleagues to donate, you know, every penny literally counts, every pound counts. And um, I think this is also what's so interesting or special about this time, just stepping back and almost re-evaluating the actual value of money, you know, and how far you can get with perhaps not so much and also making it a little bit more accessible. And also, as we've heard here, um, is Manisha also, you know, just that kindness is such a strong currency. And even if people can't give anything material, my gosh, you can give your kindness, you can be helpful. I think um, that was just a very important reminder to everyone and everyone can do that. And that's actually also an empowerment to people to know that they can, as individuals, can do things. And as you said, Paul, yes, the psychology 
of how good it feels to give. And of course, that's never the reason why one gives to feel good. You know, you give because you want to give and it has just happens to have this amazing side effect or boomerang effect. Yeah. A question again, I think to Manisha to, from um, Patricia, um, Sama, um, Patricia Hamzahi, who, hi, big call out to you, lovely to, to see your name in writing at least, if not seeing your lovely face. Um, how can there be more equal distribution of support resources, funding volunteers PPE between the NHS and social care, which is viewed as the Cinderella despite being very much on the front line? Does this need to be driven by government or by better cooperation between NHS and care? Um, hi, Patricia. I actually think it's a bit of both. I think this is probably one of the biggest lessons learned from this crisis in terms of the thinking about who may need PPE and where the priorities lie. Obviously, everything's been focused at the front end at the hospitals, but we know there are you know hundreds of thousands of carers out there visiting people in their homes or working in a nursing or residential home environment who also need protection. So I think one of the biggest, I hope, lessons learned and then something that's put into action and implemented is they are part of the conversations at a government level but also you know we have now uh, what i'd say is the, the local care networks which is uh, the, the hospital and the health and the social care should be working in a, a much more joined up fashion so really integrated and i think this really has to be addressed at that level as well and then there's a combined two questions i think this is back to nadia and to tom from charlotte and from asha who are both sort of asking, um, what do you think are the main principles businesses should aspire to, ha to um, aspire to have to be considered a business with both purpose and profit? And how do you think businesses might evolve post COVID, both positives and negatives? Will you be able to maintain your strong CSR commitments? Tom, do you want me to go? Yeah, you go first, Nadia. Okay, so I have to say, I think the CSR commitments will be actually solidified and strengthened because actually now it's really during this time that we are feeling that the impact in the, of the efforts made is really working out. Um, I also think in terms of CSR, you know, there's so, I mean, we just had a call this morning, which was all about the UN SDGs. A lot of people don't know these UN sustainability goals, those 17 goals, a lot of which, you know, are focusing on the environment, people, uh, equality, and so on. People don't know about them. And um, I think the awareness in this arena will have um, increased. I think sustainability departments will hopefully increase in size and in positive impact externally. Um, Paul, I'm very proud to say that the Atelier Swarovski jewelry collection is doing better right now than it did a year ago. It did really well in January. And that is a big question mark, or then again, not, because our Atelier Swarovski jewelry collections are nature-related collections and proceeds of that or those jewelry collections are going to the um, Nature Conservancy, to a reforestation project, you know? And we just already see perhaps a shift in um, customer buying patterns. You know, they want to buy something that's beautiful, but also they want to buy something that's meaningful and they want to buy something um, of which they know the profits will go to supporting an organization that's supporting the betterment of the world, you know? and. I think this is really a very interesting example of connecting the dots between CSR, um, environmental efforts or humanitarian efforts, but also a commercial product. So caring, community, creativity and commerciality, I think, are going to be even more so uh, linked together. Amazing. Tom? Well, I agree with Nadia a lot of that. I think the demand is there to have products that are good and thoughtful and are kinder or kind to the environment and to society. And I think it's really up to authentic entrepreneurs to fill that space and, and you know, help build the businesses and, and tell the story around the ones that are there. And they have to be authentic and they have to be caring. And I think you know, I'm confident that out of this comes society that's a little, you know, has been tilted a little bit more towards being thoughtful about what it does and what it buys. 
Yes. I mean, when I think about what I love about craft baking and about the craft people that I'm surrounded by is it's a little bit slower, but it's so good when it's done. And, yeah. you know, I just think all of us probably could slow down just a little bit and do things a little bit better and more thoughtful. And I'm hoping mm -hmm. we can stick to that. But it will take a bunch of entrepreneurs to get in there and make it happen. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that that's a, a, a really perfect um, note to begin to, to, to wrap up. And so firstly, um, the three hospitals that we're supporting through Manisha's very wonderful introduction, Lewisham and Greenwich Trust, Chelsea and Westminster, Royal Marsden. Um, again, thank you to, to Swarovski and to Gales, to Ralph Lauren, to Wasabi, to Insight Investments, to... Um, indie-based snacks to a unit to Lifesaver to City Harvest to Rockets in particular to La Tua Pasta um, and I wanted everybody to um, please do what you can um, the many ways in which you can support if you can support financially please support financially you can go to the conduits page and they're very clear and easy ways to give if you are a food company and you have ways in which you can give in kind, massively, massively um, helpful and important to do so. If there are other ways in which you can give of your time, we can put you in touch with Help Force, um, who are doing an incredible job in helping to kind of steer volunteers in, or if there are other things that you can do. Um, and I think to Tom's point, I mean, one of the reasons we established the conduit was because I think every single one of the world's big problems and, and challenges and crises is a solution waiting to happen. And that philanthropies and businesses, and in particular, a shout out to entrepreneurs, are people who can really make a difference and to bend us towards a, a more just world. Um, so so um, thank you to everybody. I am, I'm now getting peppered with a few comments from the team. Um, uh, just to to sort of you know underscore thank you to everybody who who contributed thus far and hopefully we can keep this going and support people like Manisha who are on the front lines. So okay. thank you so much for joining um, and please be in touch if there are other ways in which you can be of assistance. And Manisha, just as a kind of personal note. I always see you sitting on the fourth or the fifth or the sixth floor with a gang of people who I'm particularly <laughs> fond of, including you. Uh, and I just want to say thank you because um, you are doing courageous work and saving lives. And, and I, you know, it could be a loved one whose hands, you know, you are in their hands. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. And thank you for everything. Great. No, thank you all. And thank you so much, Paul, for getting everyone together and for doing what you are doing. Mm -hmm. Great pleasure. Yeah, thank you, Paul Wonderful. and Manisha. Thank you very much. Stay thank safe and stay well, guys. everybody. Bye-bye. Okay.